Rhetorical Quest. Understanding and using visual aids in a speech. Uh, visual aids are an important part of a speech. And we, we know that we learn a lot of what we understand. We understand it visually. Now we're going to really talk about two things, and we'll kind of divide those up. The first thing is I'm going to talk to you about visual aid basics. Uh, visual aid basics are those things that are true no matter what your visual aid is. Whether your visual aid is a book or if the visual aid is a hamster. Whether it's your sister or it is a house. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. These things are going to be generally true of visual aids. And then we're going to talk about some specific types of visual aids and some things to some things to think about. So let's go ahead. We're going to move on and start talking about some visual aid, ba aid basics. Uh, the first thing is you want to try to keep them simple. Uh, your, your visual aid shouldn't be so complicated that when your audience talks about it, they can't figure it out. And you want to choose the right one. I learned the hard way one time that to a group of elderly people, a PowerPoint isn't a really good choice for a visual aid because they don't necessarily see it as an aid to your speech. They start to see it as the speech themselves because they put it as the, the kind of TV. So you got to think about what you're going to do. You got to think about what your speech objective is. What is it you're trying to get across? Some things can be get, can be uh, gotten across really clearly uh, using using pictures or using uh, objects, but sometimes they can't be. You need to think about your skill or experience. I have seen so many students who use PowerPoints and don't know how to make them go full screen. This is completely inappropriate. If you don't know how to use something, don't do it in a visual aid. You need to practice with your visual aid. That's the, the third thing. Keep it simple, use the right one, and practice. I remember one speech I saw in which a student uh, decided she was going to make orange Julius. She worked at an orange Julius uh, store. Uh, but she realized that the blender she had was kind of gross, so she bought a new one just for the speech. Well, that was really great, except that she didn't know how to use the new one. She should have practiced a few times. Always have eye contact with your audience and not with your visual aid. See, I could be over here looking at this PowerPoint, you know, and I could be moving around. But if I'm looking at that and not at you, there's a good chance that I can lose track of you. Always explain your visual aids. Uh, this is really important. Keep them simple. Use the right one. Practice. Have eye contact with your audience and explain them. Uh, it's really important to explain your visual aids. Um, integrate them and interact with them. Make them a part of the presentation. Don't just like hold it up at the end and say, and here's my visual aid. That doesn't usually work. And there's some things that you really, really should never ever do with a visual aid. Some things that just should not happen. Things passed around during the speech. You can't integrate that because, well, one person is looking at your spoon. For the rest of the people, it's not in their hand anymore. So we can't describe maybe the little hole on the spoon or something like that. It can't be done. It doesn't work. Uh, never hand things out while speaking about them. Now, handouts make great visual aids. You send one out to each member of your audience. You have them look at it. Those make great visual aids. But here's the thing. Don't start talking about it until they have it. It is so annoying to be in a presentation and to have somebody talking about the handout and you don't have yours yet. That just doesn't work at all. Don't ever, ever use a visual aid without practice. If you don't know what you're going to do with it, it's not going to work. Don't turn your back on your audience, at least not for very long. We all know there should be good movement uh, in, your, in your presentation. That means your back might be to part of your audience every now and then for a second. Don't turn your back to your audience. It's rude. And don't let your visual aids restrict your movement. If you feel like you can't step away from your computer if you're using a PowerPoint, don't use PowerPoint. If you feel like if you're using your dog as your visual aid, you can't step away from your dog, well, maybe your dog would be a bad choice, even though puppies are cute.
Now, basically, if we were to talk about types of visual aids, the easiest thing to do would be to divide it up into two-dimensional visual aids and three-dimensional visual aids, 2D and 3D. Two-dimensional visual aids includes things like drawings, photographs, slides, maps, charts, graphs. Three-dimensional visual aids include things like objects, models, people, animals. All of these things uh, are three-dimensional visual aids. Now, those two-dimensional visual aids, we could divide those up further. We could divide them into digital visual aids and what I'm calling analog visual aids. Digital visual aids are those that you produce on a computer that stay on the computer and uh, like PowerPoint presentations, pictures that you project onto walls, movies that you want to show. All of those things are digital visual aids. Uh, analog visual aids, what I'm calling analog visual aids, are all of the things that you would actually have to bring in. And there's advantages and disadvantages. There really are to all of this. Digital visual aids are, for the most part, cheaper. Now, we'll talk in a few seconds about how much something like PowerPoint costs, and it's significant. But once you buy PowerPoint, you can make nearly infinite PowerPoints. They're more convenient. Most of us carry around a flash drive these days. Uh, we carry around a flash drive. Here's one right, right here. Uh, we, we carry these around. And uh, they're pretty convenient. They don't take much space, and they're getting smaller and smaller, and we can put more and more on them. It is great. They're also more versatile. Uh, you can be working on a PowerPoint presentation, get some new information, and change it seconds before a meeting. That's great. But they have some downsides, and they're kind of the upsides of analog vi digital, uh, visual, digital, excuse me analog visual aids. Analog visual aids are more reliable. I have never ever in my life seen a poster board break down. When the electricity goes out, having a good map doesn't really matter. They're also more durable. Analog di digital aids are more, uh, visual aids, excuse me, analog visual aids are more durable. See, this, this flash drive here has, if I keep it in pristine condition, I put it, you know, into a climate-controlled area. I never put it in my pocket, never carry it in my bag. If I'm really careful with this, it has 100,000 power erase cycle, program erase cycles. Uh, that basically means that I can plug it in about 100,000 times, and then it will die. That's if I keep it perfect. You have it knocking around in your purse. You have it moving around in uh, in your office, throw it, you throw it in your pocket, you throw it in your book bag, it's not going to last long. Uh, and we've all found that when we've had something important on a flash drive, it disappears. But how durable are analog visual aids? Well, there are cave drawings 6,000 to 10,000 years old. And they are still just as visually appealing today as they were back then. So, you know, you can think about, do you want to use a digital visual aid? Do you want to use an analog visual aid? Either one is just fine, and it just depends on what you want to use. There are some things that you need to think of uh, regarding visual aids. Uh, you need to think about color. Now, there's a simple thing, a simple little rhyme that can help you decide what colors to use on all your visual aids, on all your two-dimensional visual aids. And that is light on dark and dark on light. Opposite colors will look all right. But the thing is, what is an opposite color? See, you grew up learning about colors. You learned about how if you mix your red paint and your blue paint, you get purple. And you mix your blue paint and your yellow paint, you get green. You mix your red paint and your yellow paint, and you get orange. And hopefully your mom helped you make a big mess in the house with that stuff. Uh, if, if you did, you had a good mother. If you didn't, you had a bad mother. That's just the way it goes, and I'm sorry for you if you have a bad mother. Uh, but this is the way it works, you know. Uh, we, but what that is, that's something called subtractive color. And that's the way pigments or paints work. But it's not the way things work on the screen. See, in pigments or paints, the primary colors are red yellow, and blue. With light, the primary colors are red, blue, and green. 
and you find out that you mix things and they're totally different. Uh, red and green together makes yellow, not red and yellow makes orange. Red and blue together makes a color that we call magenta. And green and blue together makes a color that we call cyan. Now with pigments, with paints, with analog vi uh, visual aids, you mix all the colors together in perfectly equal amounts, you should get black. That's not the way it works with digital visual aids. You mix all the colors in, in equal amounts and you get white. See, this is a pretty big difference. And so if you're putting together a PowerPoint and you think, oh, I know from Christmas red and green look good together, that's because they're opposite colors in subtractive color, but you put them on a screen, red and green kind of mesh together into yellow in your eyes. It doesn't work very well. So talking specifically about digital visual aids, a lot of times we will refer to digital visual aids as PowerPoints. Uh, the word PowerPoint is kind of like the word Kleenex. You know, when somebody offers you a Kleenex, you don't say, no, I only have a Puffs, or, you know, needs a Kleenex, no, I only have a Puffs. That doesn't really work. PowerPoint is kind of the same way. It's, it's, it's the name brand. It's put out by Microsoft, and it's kind of expensive. Uh, two years ago in 2010, I'm making this video in 2012, uh, a new version of 2010 Office with PowerPoint was $349.82 for 2010. This morning, I was looking and I found it on a major website, one that normally sells books, but in this case I was looking at software. You probably can guess what I'm talking about. Uh, $121.18. That's still a lot of money for a two-year-old version. And you know what? Windows 8 is going to be coming out in the next year or so. Uh, and with Windows 8, there's going to be Office 2012 or 2013. And it's going to be back up to that $350 range. And that's a lot of money to pay. Uh, now, you might say, well, my computer came with it for free. No, it didn't. Uh, you might have gotten kind of a discount because you bought it with a computer, but when you get a computer that's bundled with a bunch of software, you are paying for the software. There are other options uh, besides PowerPoint. LibreOffice makes a really nice piece of presentation software. Uh, Keynote, if you have a Mac, you are very lucky. You can use Keynote, and it's great. Uh, Google has some presentation software that you just, if you have a Gmail account, you can use it. And sometimes you just want images, and so just put up images. Don't worry about it being a PowerPoint. So that's kind of dealing with the two-dimensional visual aids. Let's move on, and let's deal with the three-dimensional visual aids. Three-dimensional visual aids have their own challenges. Three-dimensional visual aids include things like objects, like people, like models that you bring in, all of these things. And there's a lot of trouble with three-dimensional visual aids. One problem is that you're always hiding something. In three dimensions, there's always something hidden behind. And you always need to make sure your audience can see the part that you need them to see. Sometimes we like to use living things as our visual aids. Children and animals are so cute and have a ton of pathos embedded in them. And we would just love to use those, but sometimes they don't do what we expect them to do. And sometimes we want to use something for a visual aid and it's heavy or bulky. I had this one student who wanted to show us in a speech how to change a spark plug. It was a great speech. Uh, what he finally ended up doing was he brought in a weed whacker, which had one spark plug to change, and that's how we would know how to change it. Great. Awesome. Wonderful. Except for that student was also kind of nervous. So he didn't bring in that. He didn't do his speech the first day. We went through three days of speeches. It was a uh, twice a week class. So it was a week and a half that he carried that weed whacker with him around school. Well, that can be a pretty big deal. The thing is, things always do go wrong with the visual aids. Technology doesn't work, always work. Animal and children don't always obey. Sometimes something doesn't look quite the same from the audience as it did when you made it. And so some people will say, just don't use visual aids, but I don't think that's a good idea. We learn a lot from visual aids. Now, Murphy's Law, 
If you've not heard of it, you can go look it up on Google. Murphy's Law says that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. I don't know if that's true. Most of the time, most things go right. But boy, when they go wrong, sometimes they go wrong spectacularly. And so you do need to be prepared. Always have a backup. If you're using a PowerPoint, it's a great idea to have handouts or at least be able to write on the chalkboard. You need to have some other some other choices. Uh, if you wanted to use your kids to model the clothes that you make, that's great. But if your kids are in the midst of a fist fight today, you need to have another option in case they won't play with you. So those are some things about visual aids. I hope this was uh, helpful for you. I hope it, it does a good job. And I will talk to you again soon. Have a good day.